In this video, we'll go through salmonella and talk about everything you need to know in order to answer your microbiology questions correct on USMLE and Comlex. As a brief overview, salmonella is a gram-negative rod, it's modal, it's acid labile, it's oxidase negative, it's facultative intracellular, and it's non-lactose fermenting. People say salmonella, but the word salmonella really refers to a group of multiple subtypes of bacteria. And then there's typhoid types and non-typhoid subtypes. Sometimes you'll see this written as NTS, which stands for non-typhoid salmonella. And so if you are reading about salmonella, learning about it, studying about it in class, what have you, you really wanna understand that although we say salmonella, that's an umbrella term which refers to a collection of two subtypes. And for the purposes of USMLE or Comlex, you can think about this and conceptualize this as typhoid and non-typhoid. Typhoid causes one type of disease, non-typhoid causes another. And as I go through this video, I will help you separate the clinical features of typhoid versus non-typhoid, but they share so many overlapping features that salmonella really is one group. This causes gastroenteritis and enterocolitis. Pathophysiology here, there's three things that you need to know. One, we have a VI antigen. So the VI antigen basically is a polysaccharide capsule. And what this does is it prevents phagocytosis and therefore salmonella is not destroyed by immune cells. So VI antigen prevents phagocytosis. That's the big takeaway here. Then you have the presence of a flagella. And the flagella, one, as all flagella do, promotes motility, but two, it's responsible for the evolution of something known as a type three secretion system. You don't really have to know the fine points of a, of a type three secretion system, but in short, this allows salmonella and other bacteria who also have a type three secretion system to attach to and insert bacterial contents into non-phagocytic cells. What's really important for the purposes of your board exams is that this does not, this is not in Shigella. And that's a big differentiating feature because Salmonella and Shigella can present very similarly and have a lot of overlapping features. But one thing that is a big distinction between the two, between Salmonella and Shigella, is that Shigella has no flagella. No flagella in Shigella. It rhymes, so it's kind of easy to memorize. Lastly, we have an endotoxin, and this endotoxin targets the neurovascular system, and once the endotoxin gets inside of the host, it decreases circulating neutrophils, which of course limits the immune response and makes it more likely to cause overwhelming infection. Now, in short, the way that salmonella gets in is through intestinal epithelium. So it goes through the intestinal epithelial M cells. And once it does that, it enters the intestinal epithelium through the M cells. Ultimately, it reaches lymphoid cells of the pyre patches. So if you're, if you're having nightmares from your anatomy and physiology class, here comes some pyre patches. Once it's in the pyre patches, it, after crossing the intestinal epithelium, it then gets disseminated throughout the reticuloendothelial system. Once it disseminates through the reticuloendothelial system, it can cause serious, overwhelming systemic infection. So for the purposes of exams, what's really high yield to take away from this video is that the infection goes through the M cells, through the pyre patches, hits the macrophages, and then gets disseminated through the reticuloendothelial system. Again, this is all possible because of the toxin, the VI antigen, and the flagella slash type three secretion system. So you do need to know this, you need to memorize these things for your exams because they do show up a lot. So the first mnemonic that I have for you is that VI prevents phagocytosis. And you see VI in prevents or prevents phagocytosis. So VI prevents, big, big, big high yield point. And then for the flagella, you need to know that the flagella is what's responsible for that type three secretion system. So just change flagella to having uh, three L's for type three secretion, flagella type three secretion. So prevents and flagella. If you can remember those two things, you know the pathophysiology of salmonella. Let's move on to clinical features. So as I told you when this video started, 
really there are two subtypes of salmonella. Your, there's your non-typhoidal salmonella and your typhoidal salmonella. Now your non-typhoidal salmonella is what people classically think about when they think about the generic term salmonella. That is to say a foodborne gastroenteritis plus or minus bloody diarrhea. This type of salmonella is associated with reptiles, amphibians, poultry, and eggs. So if on your exam you see any of these buzzwords, start to think non-typhoidal salmonella. The answer is going to have salmonella in the name. I would be pretty surprised if the test writer gave you both subtypes. So if you see salmonella, chances are that's the correct answer. But again, know the buzzwords, reptiles, amphibians, poultry, and eggs. You're looking for symptoms of a foodborne gastroenteritis, plus or minus bloody diarrhea. And then we have typhoidal salmonella. And this is given the name typhoidal because it causes the disease known as typhoid fever. So what you see here is early constipation, some nonspecific GI symptoms, and then what's really key is rose-colored spots on the abdomen. That's a very specific finding, and chances are they will write rose-colored spots, or they'll show you a picture of rose-colored spots on the abdomen. Sometimes you see what's known as pea soup diarrhea, but that buzzword has kind of fallen out of favor. So know the spectrum of illness, no constipation, pain, the rose-colored spots on the abdomen, and diarrhea. You don't necessarily need to memorize the term, quote, pea soup, but it may help you. In typhoid fever, with this typhoidal salmonella subtype, you really want to be aware of the potential for septic shock, hepatosplenomegaly, or meningitis. So these are complications of typhoid fever, of that typhoidal subtype of salmonella. And what's really high yield to know is that typhoidal salmonella is stored in the gallbladder of chronic carriers. And this increases the risk for gallbladder cancers. So this is a really high yield point which shows up on exams. A classic test question is that they describe somebody with salmonella and then at the, in the last sentence of the vignette, they ask either where this is stored in a chronic carrier or what this increases the risk for. And you need to associate the clinical presentation or the pathophysiology of salmonella and then use that in a third or or fourth order question to transition into one other associated high yield fact, in this case having to do with the gallbladder. Last really high yield clinical thing to know about salmonella is that in patients with sickle cell disease, there is a marked increased risk of osteomyelitis. And why this is, is that in salmonella, because of the clinical features of salmonella and the pathophysiology, when you mix that with a disease process where you have sickling and abnormal function in the capillaries and the liver and the spleen and the reticuloendothelial system, you have an increased likelihood of osteomyelitis. So we have decreased function of the liver and spleen. So you can see that in patients with sickle cell disease because of the sickling and potential to have problems in those organs, but also salmonella causes hepatosplenomegaly, and associated issues with the liver or spleen. So this is just a really confounding comorbidity. Also, you have capillary occlusion of the GI system. So because in sickle cell patients, you get capillary occlusion to, due to the sickling, salmonella enters, as we said, through the intestinal epithelium. So when you get capillary occlusion of the GI system, it makes that GI system more at risk to have those infections which go through for example, like salmonella, that intestinal epithelium. And then lastly, because of the pathophysiology of salmonella, as I talked about early on, it's disseminated through the reticuloendothelial system, which limits the immune system's ability to fight off this infection. So because of this, you're having an increased risk of osteomyelitis. So on your exam, if you have a patient with salmonella, another classic test question is to ask you which of the following the patient is at increased risk for in sickle cell disease specifically. So keep that in mind. Now for treatment, non-typhoidal salmonella, usually your treatment's going to be supportive. On your exam, if they want to test you on treatment, they'll give you typhoidal salmonella, and the answer is gonna be fluoroquinolones. In somebody who cannot have fluoroquinolones or there's drug resistance, you would then use ceftriaxone plus azithromycin, but the answer is gonna be fluoroquinolones. So that's all you need to know. Good luck.